Yeah, I mean, Ed lives up in the Marin area. I yeah, live down yeah. south. I live down south, and uh, Mal lives in the city. So, where do you live in the city? Uh, Mal lives in the city. I don't know. Well, Mal, where, yeah, I know yeah. he does. <clears throat> yeah, one of my kids lives in the city. I was saying, and the other one lives out north of the city. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so Dr. Ellen Bogan, you're ready to get started. We can go ahead. Um, okay. So welcome everyone to UCSF's Cardiology Grand Rounds. I'm honored to present today Dr. Kenneth Ellen Bogan, who will be speaking to us on left bundle branch pacing, among other topics. Dr. Ellen Bogan is Poly Heart Center's Director of Clinical Cardiac Physiology and Pacing at Virginia Commonwealth University. He holds the Martha M. and Harold W. Kimmerling Chair in Cardiology there. Dr. Ellen Bogan has an extensive career in research, focusing on novel ablation techniques and types of pacing, including pacing from the left bundle branch system, which we'll hear more about today. He has been the PI of over 100 funded grants and published over 400 journal articles and book chapters. He serves on the editorial board of multiple cardiology journals, served on the writing committee for AHA, ACC, HRS guidelines, and in 2015, he was awarded the Distinguished Teacher Award from the Heart Rhythm Society. And with that, welcome Dr. Ellen Bogan. We're really excited to have you here to give your talk. And if over the course of the talk, anyone has questions, please type them into the chat box or raise your hand and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. And of course, if you prefer to keep the questions anonymous, you can also direct message me the question. Dr. Ellen Bogan. Well, thanks very much. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about conduction system pacing, but what I'm gonna focus on is not the specific details about how to do it and how many turns you should do, but more about why we're here, why we're talking about conduction system pacing. And so to think about conduction system pacing, you have to go back a very long time and we'll cover to think about the basic hemodynamics of cardiac pacing, the limitations of cardiac resynchronization therapy. We'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the conduction system. That is why we can use the conduction system at all to pace the heart and talk a little bit about what we know about conduction system pacing. What we're gonna learn about in the next five years that I think is gonna make a big difference. So this paper, published in the American Journal of Physiology is by somebody named Carl Wiggers. And those of you who are my age probably read some papers by Carl Wiggers, but this was an animal experiment, very simple experiment where he recorded pressure from the dog aorta and an LV with, with a Millard type catheter. And you can see that this is the native aortic pulse and the LV tracing with LV apical pacing, you still have a pretty good LV pressure pulse, pretty good aortic pulse pressure, but not the same as normal. And then again, when you have native conduction, now you pace from the LV base and you can see there is a more marked diminution of the LV stroke volume. So what we learn from his experiments is that pacing site location matters and it matters a lot. But that was 1925 and it really took us a while to sort of figure that out. We figured that out in the last 20 years. These are two papers. <laughs> These are two papers, one from JAMA, one from New England Journal of Medicine. But the take home message from these papers and the first paper we actually wrote in 2003 was part of the MOST study, which was a study in over 2000 patients with six sinus syndrome, randomized to get dual chamber pacemakers. Everyone got a dual chamber pacemaker, but the pacing mode was randomized to either VVI or DDD. And it turned out the patients with dual chamber pacing who had ventricular pacing did worse. So this was a study in patients who had heart failure and had implantable cardiac defibrillators. 
and they were programmed either DDDR or VBI. And you can see the risk of developing heart failure, worsened heart failure, or being hospitalized for heart failure or dying was twice as high in the patients who had defibrillators programmed DDDR. And in this is a study of patients who have BIV pacemakers and BIV defibrillators compared or randomized to patients who had dual chamber pacemakers or defibrillators. And you can see the patients who had RV pacing were more likely to have heart failure and more likely to have LV dilatation. So RV pacing, particularly RV apical pacing is worse. So people decided that pacing, a high burden of RV apical pacing can induce a cardiomyopathy. And that burden is somewhere between anything over 20% RV pacing. Anything over 20% of RV pacing can make a patient susceptible to pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. Now, it may take a month, six months, a year, or 10 years, but the incidence is believed to be as high as 20 to 30% at three to four years. It's very important that clinicians be thinking about what pacing-induced cardiomyopathy is. So you all can recognize the patient who gets a pacemaker and six months later, a year later, they come back to the hospital and their EF has dropped from 55 or 60% to 30%. They have heart failure or they have AFib and they're hospitalized. But it can simply be somebody has an EF of 40% and now it's 30%. Or somebody has a normal EF of 55 to 65% and now it's around 50%. Um, so it can be just somebody who is doing great, and six months later, their BMP is 400. So there's a whole spectrum of pacing-induced cardiomyopathy from very mild subclinical symptoms to florid pulmonary edema and a big drop in ejection fraction. Now, the effects of RV apical pacing have been studied. The changes in electrical and mechanical activation are listed in this slide. But I think the pathophysiologic mechanism is shown here. And that is RV apical pacing creates electromechanical dyssynchrony, creates electromechanical dyssynchrony where the septum and the lateral wall of the LV are out of phase. And that results in abnormal myocardial perfusion and increased oxygen demand in patients who are RV apically paced, which then leads to abnormal contractile function, increased filling pressures, maladaptive cardiac remodeling, and then neurohormonal and sympathetic activation, which leads to further, further uh, depression of cardiac function and just continues with this negative feedback loop, which in many patients over time will lead to a pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. So simply put, simply put, you have two factors, electrical dyssynchrony and mechanical dyssynchrony. Men seem to be a little more susceptible than women. The wider your pace QRS is, the more likely you are to develop pacing-induced cardiomyopathy or PIC. So when somebody comes to me and their pace QRS is 210, 220 milliseconds, I pretty much know they're gonna have pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. The wider the baseline QRS is, because that makes the patient somehow more susceptible to pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. Lower the ejection fraction and the greater RV pacing percentage. So pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, the more you pace and the lower your EF is, the more susceptible you are to develop pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. And the wider the QRS is with pacing over four pacing, the more susceptible you are. So there is a concept of what we call the synchrony-associated cardiomyopathy. And we're gonna talk about it today. We're gonna to talk about both types 
pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, and left bundle branch block cardiomyopathy because conduction system pacing is a way to treat both of these. With left bundle branch block cardiomyopathy, you have a left bundle branch and the cure restoration is typically greater than 120 to 130 milliseconds. And the patients come in with a low EF or with heart failure symptoms. And you have to think about how to treat that. You can treat it with CRT, you can treat it with CSP, either cardiac resynchronization therapy or conduction system pacing. And patients who have a pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, well, you can treat that with, again, conduction system pacing or cardiac resynchronization therapy, but also with algorithms that can minimize RV pacing, particularly if they have six sinus syndrome or they don't have advanced high-grade AV block. Now, before the last 10 to 15 years, we thought the best way to prevent pacing-induced cardiomyopathy was to prolong the AV interval in patients who have pacemakers, right? So make that AV interval 280, 320, 340, 400 to encourage intrinsic conduction and avoid ventricular pacing as much as possible. And all these pacemaker companies came up with these incredibly clever pacing algorithms that decrease the percentage of ventricular pacing in order to reduce the risk of pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, but it resulted in AV and VV synchrony. If your PR interval is 360 milliseconds, right, your AVs are dyssynchronous. And also as a result, your RV and LV could be dyssynchronous. So these patients have really, it's one thing if your PR interval is 220, it's another thing if your PR interval is 400. But non-physiologic AV delays possibly proarrhythmia. So because of that, patients often have very long AV intervals or very long PV intervals, and they end up with basically non-physiologic AV delays. So how did, conduct, how did minimizing ventricular pacing work out? Well, it didn't change your risk of persistent AF, it didn't change your risk of all-cause hospitalization, right? It didn't favor that. Um, and at the end of the day, it didn't change mortality. So basically, minim using algorithms to minimize the amount of ventricular pacing, you're really treating yourself. It doesn't seem to have any impact on persistent AF, paroxysmal AF, all-cause hospitalization, or all-cause mortality. Now, the natural treatment for pacing-induced cardiomyopathy, okay, is cardiac resynchronization therapy. It's been great. We've clinical trials have included thousands of patients. And the problem is not everyone responds to cardiac resynchronization therapy. Basically, a good way to remember non-responders to CRT is the three Ps. P, number one, is patient selection. No poor patient selection because patients don't have dyssynchrony or they have SCAR or they have RV dysfunction or they have arrhythmias like AFib that prevent, prevent you from pacing the coronary sinus and left ventricle um, or they have other comorbidities. The second P is suboptimal lead position. And that's a lead in an anterior vein enter vein of the coronary sinus. You think you're capturing the coronary sinus, but you're not. Um, or the um, pacing lead is just in a place where it doesn't seem to benefit the patient because that's not where their electrical dyssynchrony is. And the third P is non-optimal device programming. The AV timing's off, the RBLV timing is off, the upper rate programming is incorrect. They have too much AFib and they're fusing with their pace beats and not really controlling the pace beats. So those are the three Ps, patient selection, lead position, and device programming. And these are a bunch of clinical trials of CRT. And 
regardless of how you define CRT as death or heart failure hospitalization, LV and systolic and LV diastolic volumes, New York Heart Association functional class, six minute walk time, or some sort of composite of all those measures, you can see over time. And, and I've even published a paper in the last six months that shows the non-responder rate still remains about 20 to 30%. No matter what we've done, it's still way, way too high. We, we also know that, as I said with my very first slide, pacing site matters and it matters a lot. This was a study done in Bordeaux where they took a baseline measurement of cardiac contractility, DPDT, in patients. So with intrinsic conduction, this is AAI pacing shown in the blue. And then they put a catheter in various branches of the coronary sinus. And what they found is it really does matter. The location, even in the coronary sinus, depending upon what branch in the coronary sinus you put your pacing lead, you can see the best branch, DPDT went up 50%. The worst branch didn't even go up 10%. And look at this patient, the best branch went up 35%. The worst branch, it went down almost 20%. So there's a big difference in outcomes in terms of how you set up your device. Here we go, sorry. So it was thought that maybe the best thing is not to pace the coronary sinus in epicardial structure, but to pace the LV endocardium. So maybe you could do a transeptal puncture, put a pacing lead transeptally across the atrium into the LV free wall, or you could go transaortically um, into the LV free wall, or you can do a transeptal puncture through the ventricle, again, in the transaortic again in the uh, LV free wall. We're gonna go transapically, and that's been done recently at VCU. Or you can go wirelessly. So that's a little bion electronic capsule that can send information from how, uh, can send information from, uh, receive information from a pacemaker that's endocardial, and then that could trigger this to fire. The specific details about how this work I'll go into in another second, but I think what's important to take home, to think about as a cardiologist is, we know from when we were medical students that there's something called the Hisperkinji system. And the Hisperkinji system is high speed electrical transfer of impulses from the septum to the free wall. So wouldn't it be better to pace the side of the left ventricle where there's endocardial transmission of electrical activation as opposed to epicardially, which is what we do when we do cardiac resynchronization therapy. Well, this idea makes so much sense that people decided, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna come here, we're gonna do an atrial transeptal puncture and leave a wire there. And so the clinical trials were done. You see some of the clinical trials listed here. Um, that have looked at transeptal perf, uh, transeptal um, punctures to allow LV endocardial pacing. And here's the problem, lifelong oral anticoagulation. These studies were done, as you can see, they were published in the 2016, 2016, 2018, 2017, but these studies were done four or five years before that. So maybe around 2010 in general, and you can see um, the stroke risk here, the TIA risk here, stroke or TIA risk and death. And you can realize that leaving a lead across an atrial septum or across a mitral valve has significant burden significant risk of forming clots on it. And so this is a pretty high risk of stroke. 
associated with transient subtherapeutic INRs. Now you can say we have DOAX now, so, so this isn't so bad, but you know, people on DOAX still have strokes or TIAs. So it is important to think about, really quite important to think about the downsides of putting a lead in the LV endocardium. And as those of us who do lead extraction say, often it is don't put a lead in unless you have a plan on how to get it out. And this, is, this could prove to be very difficult in patients in whom they've had an LV endocardial lead for a bunch of years. So now we're gonna go on and um, these are all problems if you have to do a lead extraction from the LV, it could be uh, problematic, you could damage the mitral valve. So this is the current LV endocardial pacing. There is an electrode here in the LV endocardium that you can implant typically transeptally. There's no lead, so it's a leadless uh, pacemaker, but it doesn't include a battery. It basically, you have to implant a battery in the abdomen connected to a transmitter on the chest wall. That transmitter sends ultrasound pulses of energy to this electrode and it converts the ultrasound energy to electrical energy. But it can't do that until it's triggered. So you have to have a transvenous pacemaker defibrillator and the RV electrical pacing triggers the, um, the release of ultrasound energy from the battery and transmitter and then converts it to electrical energy. What's important here is what we learn from this setup. First of all, as opposed to epicardial pacing through the coronary sinus, endocardial pacing directly from the LV shows 85% responder rate. 85% of patients improve and this study includes a lot of patients who have previously failed conventional CRT. You can compare the responder rate at 69 or 54 or 52% in other clinical trials. So to me, what's fascinating is not the fact that EF goes to up and the end diastolic and end systolic volume go down. What's fascinating is this change in QRS duration. So that the patients had an average EKG with a 165 milliseconds, but boy, after six months, you can see there's a dramatic remodeling, but it's even greater in the patients who had, it's even greater in the patients who had a IV with, with an endocardial LV lead. But here's what's amazing to me. The patient's baseline QRS is 180 milliseconds with RV only pacing. The intrinsic QRS is 165. They get LV endocardial by V pacing. And two weeks later, if you um, two weeks later, if you look at the intrinsic QRS, it's gone 165 to 156. One month later, it's shrunk to 150. Six months later, the intrinsic QRS, when you stop pacing, is 139 milliseconds. That's a dramatic decrease. And I know you probably don't believe me, so look at this. This is one month, here's an intrinsic QRS of 215 milliseconds, and it started about 230, and at six months, it's 191. So that's a dramatic decrease in the QRS duration. And you can see the difference here. This is intrinsic versus paste. But you see the patient's QRS duration has truly changed. They have electrical remodeling from getting a great result from endocardial pacing. So with that in mind, I want you to think about where, if you're gonna pace LV endocardium and you have a choice of pacing the LV endocardium from the LV free wall or the interventricular septum, it makes more sense to me to pace from the interventricular septum. And in particular, the added bonus is if you pace from the interventricular septum, you may also not only pace the LV septum, which may not be too bad at all, but you can pace the conduction system. Now let's hold on a second and think and talk about that a little bit more. 
So thanks to the great work of Tawara, a Japanese uh, physiologist, an anat anatomist, he studied extensively the, the, the anatomy of the conduction system and by sectioning these hearts was able to figure out the, the connections to the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. And here you can see from a slide given to me by Dr. Shiv Kumar, you can see the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and the septum over here is really the key critical sphere or the key critical area where you're gonna be pacing if you wanna get the conduction system. And here's a close up that you can see the septal leaf of the tricuspid valve. You can see the membranous septum is transluminated from the left ventricle. The membranous septum marks where the his bundle lies. And so again, the membranous septum, here's the penetrating bundle of his that rides along the membranous septum and then distally branches into the um, left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block for the right ventricle. Now, this um, figure shows a cartoon. This is a superimposed left bundle branch region superimposed on the ventricular septum. Now this is an LV endocardial structure. It's very superficial on the endocardium. And the important point I want you to make, I want you to think about is that it has many fibers, okay? And you could probably pace, if you pace near the septal leaf of the tricuspid valve and you put your lead in the interventricular septum, the virtual anode you create by pacing is probably gonna capture this L, these, some of these LV endocardial fibers. And so you'll have capture of the left bundle or the his or the area between the his Purkinje system here and the right and left bundle branch block. So this image is taken from the monograph of Tawara. And the reason why I show you this image is you can see the serpiginous intertwining of branches from the conduction system. Although we talk about left anterior fascicular block and left posterior fascicular block, there is in most patients, maybe more than 75% of patients, a substantial uh, septal portion of the conduction system. And this just shows that with India ink staining, this is um, the aorta, this is the non-coronary cusp of the aorta there. Um, you can see the left bundle coming from there uh, or going, going through there, I should say. So you see the left bundle diving under the aorta and you can see the papillary muscles anterior and posterior. And you can see in these, um, you can see there's a network of Purkinje fibers that goes right to the base of the anterior papillary muscle, to both papillary muscles, both the anterior and the posterior papillary muscle. You can see there's a Purkinje network typically innervating them. And you can see here with India in ink dye, India ink dye to stain the his Purkinje system. You can see much more clearly how amazing, almost as, it's almost like a network of electrical conduction. And this, however, is based on mini pigs that have um, high density CT scanning and special staining for the conduction system. And you can even see the muscle fibers winding around here. You can see the um, uh, trabeculae from the right ventricle and the ones in the papillary muscle to the right ventricle cut. But here you see staining right below the non-coronary cusp of the aorta. Here's the non-coronary cusp of the aorta. And you have the a AV conduction system, the AV node in the his Purkinje system, which approximately goes into a right bundle branch and a left bundle branch. How long they travel together is highly variable, but 
you see the peripheral network of the right bundle system shown in this tan or red coloring. You can see this is all the peripheral distal hysperkinji network, right? But don't see the um, left bundle here. Here you see the left bundle in purple. I'm sorry, I want to go back. That is the left bundle there. It's not marked. Here's the left bundle. Here is the left bundle laid out. And you can see the left bundle right below, um, right at the bundle of his bifurcating into a left bundle. Here you see the peripheral network of fibers. And you can see, although it's a little bit foreshortened in that view, you can see just all the areas. The left bundle has many, uh, many regions and you can get a pretty good left bundle um, from most regions once you understand that physiology and left bundle. Now I said the left bundle is superficial. I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and digress. This paper was published 52 years ago. And we're gonna talk about pacing for conduction system disease and pacing for heart failure, I, e.g. pacing for left bundle branch block. It's an amazing study. I, I forget now, but this is, uh, I think six or 10 human hearts. In 1970, in the Netherlands, they took hearts from patients who had intracranial bleeds or massive strokes. And the patients uh, donated their hearts or uh, hearts were taken at the time of their death, willed to whatever. And they had point, uh, the hearts were perfused and they were able to keep the shape of the hearts by putting beeswax in both the right and left ventricle. They stuck plunge electrodes in here. They did epicardial point by point mapping. Now there weren't computerized mapping systems then. They literally took point by point and measured everything and went back and created these maps. And this is a map of basically a normal human heart and the total excitation of the heart. And I give this, give this to you to show you how the septum is activated first early on the left side of the interventricular septum. See, so it goes to the base of the papillary muscle moderator band here. And you see that at the end of the day, um, the late, later electrical activation here, here's the interventricular septum, RV, LV. Now we can do the same type of mapping studies with non-invasive mapping. Obviously we don't wanna put catheters in people's hearts, you can take a CT scan with the patient wearing a vest, 252 electrode body vest. So you get patient specific geometry. Each one of these electrodes is a unipolar electrode. You record an electrical signal from each one of those. And if you know where it overlays the heart, you can, by using very uh, elegant mathematics, go back and figure out how far exactly where the electrode is on the patient's chest. And based on the electrical signal you record here, you can guess what that electrical signal will look like on the outside of the human heart. And using the inverse mathematical theorem, you can go back and recreate the epicardial activation of the atrium or the ventricle. So in this one study, they took a whole bunch of people with left bundle branch block. And as you can imagine with left bundle branch block, there's no early LV breakthrough. The RV breakthrough is rapid and centrifugal across the RV free wall. LV activation is impaired anteriorly and posteriorly. And the basal region of the LV, the basal region of the LV is the latest region. So this is an example of a bunch of patients with left bundle branch block. And I show you this only to tell you, this is the LAD shown in black and LAD shown here. I want you to look at where the latest area of electrical activation is. Here it's at the base, here it's at the lateral wall, here it's just in this tiny area at the anterolateral base, and here it's in this wide area. So the area of slowing in left bundle branch block varies dramatically from patient to patient. So we wanna pace the left bundle. And before, a couple of years ago, we figured, well, left bundle branch block, what the hell does it mean? It means that 
it must mean that patients have diffuse, severe, permanent conduction system disease, and it's disease that's distal, so you'll never, ever be able to pace the left frontal branch block. Well, it turns out that is wrong in about 75 like to 85% of patients, that the site of block is sometimes here, high up in the distal his bundle, or sometimes proximally in the left bundle. And occasionally, occasionally, it's in the distal his Purkinje system. And we were able to figure that out by putting this 20 pole catheter across the aorta, across the aortic valve. And here's a his bundle catheter. So here's the interventricular septum. And this 20 pole catheter is measuring the electrical activation of the interventricular septum. So if you learn another thing from today's lecture, left bundle branch block is more often a disease of the conduction into the left bundle or within the left bundle rather than deep distally within the left bundle branch or in the distal hispercongy distal system. Now this study in 36% of patients that intact Purkinje activation indicating that their electrical disease was distal and diffuse. But however, there's a big but here. Most of these patients have ventricular tachycardia. They were being studied at the time of the VT ablation. They were on multiple antiarrhythmic drugs, multiple poisons. So probably this number is closer to 15%, uh, maybe even a little bit less. This bundle pacing was first done in 2000. Uh, Desmook described it, permanent direct his bundle pacing, but it wasn't reliable. They had to have a backup RV pacing catheter and it took 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half to place a his bundle lead. So not really a good place to go. In 2015, Breek Sharma, Sharma uh, published a study um, in heart rhythm, uh, and he uh, trained here, did a lot of work here, conducted a feasibility study in 200 patients, showed a high, about 80% of patients, his bundle pacing was successful without the use of a catheter to, to show you where the his bundle is or backup lead. And that has been supplanted, and actually, believe it or not, the first description of left bundle branch block pacing was in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. It was a case report. It's a fascinating case report. We could not get this published in seven or 10 other journals. But basically, it was a patient who had AFib, had AV node ablation, and had a CRT system put in. And the patient had a cardiomyopathy that didn't get better after their AV node was ablated and after CRT system was implanted. They had neurocardial association class three heart failure, and they had a low EF. And the patient got a left bundle pacing lead instead and shut off the CRT. And lo and behold, the patient's QRS with fusion pacing um, was much narrower. This is a different patient who had sinus rhythm, not AFib, but it was the same concept. I got much narrow, so the QRS with conduction system pacing may have been 140, narrowed to 140 milliseconds, but we were able to narrow the QRS to 90-ish milliseconds. Patient had a remarkable improvement in EF. Now, I don't wanna sit here and tell you we understand everything about the mechanisms of how bundle branch block or AV block is treated by conduction system pacing. There are a variety of theories, these theories include the theory of longitudinal dissociation. That is, there are multiple pathways of conduction to the ventricle, uh, as we talked about. And then what happens here is you're pacing one of the surviving areas, one of the bundles, and it's you're pacing enough to get conduction. Another theory is that when you get bundle branch block, or heart block, you only have delay of conduction. You don't have fibrosis. You don't have complete lack of conduction. And so you're able to capture or get the conduction system to work well enough to conduct. Another theory is that 
you when you pace, you capture wide area and you can recruit part of the conduction system that couldn't be recruited before. And you, you capture both the conduction system and the septum. And that's why left bundle branch block is so reliable um, and patients seem to do so well. Uh, sometimes called the nodal capture, but in addition to that, in addition to capturing the anode, there's something called the virtual electrode. And that's the area around the electrode that's actually can be electrically excited. And that can be 10 times larger than the size of the electrode. There is some nomenclature you should know about just as a cardiologist. You can get not you can get capture of the septal myocardium plus the conduction system. And you see that here. It's diagnosed by the fact the patient has a slurred upstroke, almost we call it a pseudo-delta wave. You see a pacing spike in every single lead. And then you can see in most leads, there's no isoelectric interval. The QRS is right next to the pacing spike as a slurred upstroke. With selective his bundle or left bundle capture, there'll be an isoelectric interval. With his bundle pacing, that's generally one to one and a half blocks, 40 to 60 milliseconds. You can see that beautifully illustrated in this example of selective his bundle capture due to latency from the stimulus to the QRS. That latency represents a conduction time from the uh, distal pacing electrode through the his Purkinje system to the QRS. You see how narrow this QRS is. And so no septal myocardium, just his bundle as shown here. The same thing for left bundle branch block. You can selectively capture the left bundle only as shown here in this EKG. Um, and this is no latency between the stimulus and the QRS. And you can see um, the same sort of thing, this latency here. When you only have left bundle branch block capture, you're gonna look in V1, you're always gonna have an incomplete, almost always have an incomplete right bundle branch block. What does that look like fluoroscopically? Well, this is what his bundle pacing lead looks like. And in this patient, Look at the, um, the suture from the uh, closing the chest, sternum. You can see a little bit lower and more apical. His bundle pacing, left bundle pacing. More distal, more apical. And overlay with the AV nodal conduction system. And you can see how that works. LAO, left bundle, you can see where that electrode inserts into the left bundle. Can imagine that. Here is a, a picture. This is, you can see the sheath proximal to the proximal electrode, and we're injecting contrast through the sheath. And you can see this is the RV endocardium. So this lead is in the LV septum. And it is this virtual electrode that allows us to capture the conduction system there. So here's the left bundle. The great thing about left bundle is this has a very small landing zone. This is a very large landing zone. And the his bundle is surrounded by connected tissue in this mason trichome stain. And here you can see the difference is that you have, here's your interventricular septum. Here you can see you have the conduction systems here. Here's your left bundle. Here's your left bundle. You have some connective tissue in between. So very, very good recording. Um, very good ability to get into the left bundle because there's a lot of muscle here and only a fair amount of connective tissue uh, shown here. But here you have a ton of connective tissue. Look at all this stuff around the his bundle. No better part of the heart insulated in the his bundle. And here I show you the venogram or the um, picture of the left bundle lead. And I want you to look at the echo and you can see, you can see that the LV electrode just lies right below the surface, right below the surface of the LV endocardium. Hence, you can easily capture a conduction system pacing. I'm uh, gonna go ahead and skip over this. Um, this is a study published in the European Heart Journal two months ago. It shows in Europe with 2,500 patients, 
92% success for pacing the left bundle in bradycardia, 82% for heart failure. That's mostly left bundle. These were the complications. That has certainly not been our experience. We've not had, we've had one acute perfor one or two acute perforations to the LV out of 700 patients, maybe less than 1% lead dislodgement, and none of these other stuff happened. Look, here's the left bundle branch block, 165 milliseconds with left bundle pacing. You narrow it to 104 milliseconds. You just don't get as narrow QRS with CRT. Here's the his bundle. Here's a left bundle lead. Here's another left bundle lead. So you can get them, you can move down the septum, move down the septum until you find a good spot. When we look at his bundle pacing and outcomes compared to RV pacing, we see there's significant improvement in outcomes. This includes everybody, even patients who only had 20 or 30 or 40% or 0% RV pacing, but death, heart failure, hospitalization, or upgrade to a BIV pacing. We can see clearly his bundle pacing has 29% less events than um, RV apical pacing. Um, it is has an HA, ACC, class 2A, and class 2B indication. Look, putting one of these conduction system pacemakers in for people that have failed CRT is a no-brainer. That's what we do in, in these patients. How about, this is a study we published, CRT in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy using left bundle branch block pacing, 100 consecutive patients. You can see that 97% success rate, your restoration goes from 168 to 102 in real life with all these patients. What a great result. And you can see it um, cha changes the EF, uh, number of patients who respond, whose EFs normalize at 12 months, three quarters of patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and left bundle, their EF normalizes at 12 months. Pretty impressive. There are limitations. Risk of tricuspid regurg seems to be markedly decreased with the very small leads we use for left bundle pacing. There is a risk of interventricular septal perforation or damage to one of the arteries in the septum. It's very rare, but the risk is not zero. Risk of a septal intramural hematoma, um, risk of lead fracture, and a need for future lead extraction is a concern. This is just a hemodynamic slide showing you CRT can do this. CRT can do this, but conduction system pacing gives you an extra boost in terms of how well your heart functions. So left versus left CRT is a PCORI study of over 3,000 patients. We're going to, um, we funded to do with um, $31 million. These are the primary outcomes, secondary outcomes, tertiary outcomes. The study will start in January. This is the cost. This is the cost. This is a study design, 55 centers, 45 in the US, 10 in Canada. It will involve echoes, EKGs, device checks, quality of life. And these are all the planned and ongoing studies. In conclusion, chronic RV pacing is detrimental in many patients. Con uh, conduction system pacing should be strongly considered in patients with anticipated high RV pacing burden. Randomized controlled trials are needed for assessing long-term outcome of conduction system pacing for resynchronization therapy. His bundle pacing is the ideal physiologic pacing technique, but it's technically challenging at implant, and we can't implant his bundle catheters in everyone. Left bundle branch block pacing is the best, the most practical, and I want to thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Ellen Bogan. That was a great talk. Uh, so yes, if anyone has questions in the audience, please leave it in the chat so we can call on you or raise your hand and we'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. I was just wondering, you know, it seems like now we have a bunch of different options for pacing. Do you think it would be worthwhile to do a randomized clinical trial of, for example, like CRT versus left bundle branch pacing versus his pacing? Yes. Well, that's what we're doing. I'm sorry. I didn't, uh, I, the time was short. So we're doing that. That's 2,000 patients. So they're randomized to either a BIV defibrillator or a HIS or a defibrillator with a HIS or left bundle lead instead of a CS lead. If their EF is 36 to 
Then they get randomized, then they are randomized to a bivy pacemaker with a coronary sinus lead versus either a his or left bundle pacing lead. So that's ex that's such a good idea. We're doing it. It's gonna be, it's gonna take the next five to seven years of my life, but we're gonna do this. It's funded and we're starting in January. Nice. And is there a reason for not considering left bundle branch pacing as a first line therapy for people with pacemaker mediated cardiomyopathy? Um, you know, one of the diagrams you showed is if they're CRT non-responders, when we would start to think about it, but I'm just curious if there's a reason not to be thinking of it a little more, uh, upstream in the, in the process. Well, um, I think the people would say, well, we know, yes, there are non-responders to CRT, but CRT has been studied in thousands and thousands of patients, like eight, 10,000 patients have participated in clinical trials. So I think we have to do the clinical trials before we jump there. That's not to say we haven't jumped there because in Richmond, the only pacing lead we put in is a left bundle pacing lead. And we have about a 91, 92% success rate. So that's what we do here, but I don't think it should become the law of the land until clinical trials have proven that. There was a question about, are there prorhythmic effects due to left septal fascicular pacing? We don't seem to see any. We're actually gonna report on that at uh, HRS 2023, um, or we at least submitted an abstract looking at that. That's a great question, um, but I'm really excited there. Um, I did go a little quickly at the end, but I want you to realize there are over 60 randomized clinical trials which about 15 or 20 are very large randomized clinical trials. But there are numerous clinical trials that are looking at all these questions in different patient groups. So, um, yeah. Dr. Goldschlager, you had raised your hand. Did you have a question? Maybe it was an accident. Um, Dr. Moss, you had a question. Do yeah, so Josh, oh, sorry. Question. yeah, I see oh. your question, Josh. Um, with every new solution, there's always a new problem. Um, I don't know, so Josh asked a highly technical question, one which I don't have any experience with, and that's stylite-driven leads. They're being used more to pace the conduction system. Um, I, so again, my personal, so at VCU we've used, we've probably put in by now close to a thousand 3830s, which is a non um, a non stylite driven lead, a non stylite driven lead, um, which uses a sheath, a, 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 a preformed sheath or a steerable sheath, and this lead is tiny, and that's why in our experience it doesn't cause TR, and because the heart beats more physiologically, you actually see less TR no MR obvious, or no, you know, MR is better as well. Again, you know, data we're collecting, but the, I think leads can be designed that are very um, robust, the 3830. Now granted, we don't have 10,000 implants. We only have a thousand, but 3830 has been around for over 10 years. It's the go-to lead for pediatric cardiac electrophysiologists. And the, long, and, and the reason they do it is because children, many children who have pacemakers um, have congenital complete heart block and they're otherwise normal children. And therefore they're playing baseball or kick or soccer or whatever. And they're, you know, fighting with their siblings and getting hit and kicked in the chest. So, um, but th that lead seems to have remarkably reliable longevity. I don't think we have any idea with this new hinge point how things are going to go. So I think, you know, we put all our eggs in one basket because that lead's been around for a long time. But I think with, with stylet driven leads, um, we've learned a lot about making leads, but I would be slow to put all my bags in a new type of lead that goes in a new place, you know, put all my eggs in that basket. I'd be very careful about doing it. I have concerns similar to what you do. Can I ask a question, Layla and Ken? It's Nora. Go sure. Do we have enough information on 
uh, uh, lead performance over time between his bundle and left bundle branch pacing? Well, we're, um, we have his, so that, that's a great question. So what Dr. Goldschlag is getting at is, you know, does conduction system disease progress over time? So you pace the his bundle, don't put a backup lead and the patient dies or comes in with heart block, um, distal to the side of pacing. So we've been doing this now for um, almost 10 years or eight years. And Dr. Vijay Raman's been doing it for 10 to 12 years. As far as we know, the only problem we've seen is, you know, people with his bundle pacing, if they have a high threshold at 12 months, there aren't that many patients who develop new high thresholds, but um, left bundle branch block has only been around for less than five years, but exit block does not seem to be a problem. Of course, the point's well taken, it's only been five years. Um, so we don't know long-term performance of leads for left bundle. We don't know long-term stability of thresholds, but all the data that's been collected so far seems to be quite positive. And if you think about it, let's say you do lose capture of the left bundle, well, then you're left with septal pacing, which some people still think is physiologically almost as good as, almost as good as, or some Europeans believe as good as um, conduction system pacing. But all, all questions, we, we just put together again for an abstract, which we submitted um, midterm follow-up of his bundle pacing, which we did, we, we have about five, six years follow-up. Great, any other questions for Dr. Ellenbogen from the audience? I, I don't wanna, I mean, I think, you know, this can transform the field of pacing back from RV apical pacing to coronary sinus pacing is pacing the outside of the heart. How can that be good to reverse the electrical activation sequence? Well, it's obviously helped a lot of patients. We put it in CRT all the time, but back to the endocardium and the Hisperkinji system. And it's amazing to realize that left bundle pacing in the vast majority of patients for left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block or heart block gets into the Hisperkinji system and conducts with a relatively narrow QRS in the vast majority of patients. So it's not a permanent thing. It's not a progressive thing. And um, people still can have pretty good conduction if you pace distal to the, to the lesion. It's a pretty incredible thought when you think about medical school and we thought, oh, it's all fibrotic, you know, nothing works, it's, but it's not true at all. So it's been a real, real education in understanding conduction system disease. Anyway, th thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much again, Dr. Ellenbogen for such a fantastic talk. It was really informative for us, as you mentioned, just to learn about uh, all the novel pacing techniques that have come out recently. So we will have a recording of this available on our division's YouTube page. And for those in the audience, we're going to have a hiatus uh, for Grand Rounds over the holiday season. Our next Grand Rounds will be back on January 11th. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. Take care. Yeah. Thank, you. thank have good, you. Have a good holiday. Bye. Thanks, Henry. Yeah. Phoebe.